While I don't know exactly if my story classifies as weird or strange, I figured you would at least appreciate to hear it. Every year in June, my husband and I like to go on our annual camping trip. This year, in 2020, we headed down to Central Oregon, near Crater Lake. This happens every year in June, right around the summer solstice. It's the best time of year to go, and the Pacific Northwest offers a plethora of places to explore, camp, hike, swim, and a multitude of other outdoor activities to keep yourselves entertained and enjoying the outdoors. Instead of staying put at one solid campground for the entirety of the week that we're camping, we like to kind of hop around every couple days. Every campground offers something new and different, and different sights to see, smell, and check out. And it's always fun to explore new areas. So forgive me when I can't exactly remember the name or location that this happened, but it did make my husband and I feel very uneasy about the entirety of the area in which we were camping. After pulling into what appeared to be a desolate campground, we thought we had struck gold. Having no one else there on the weekdays is amazing as it is, but having virtually no one to compete with is very nice. It's not that there's a problem with other people, it's just that it's more quiet. And it's nice to have privacy, more to yourself. We were approached by one of the rangers before we could even get all the way in. He looked very unnerved, to say the least. We started talking to him, and he asked us what our plans were, where we were from, how long we planned on staying. You could tell he was trying to make small talk, but we kind of wanted to cut to the chase. My husband and I can both visibly see he was clearly bothered by something, a little pale, sweaty, kept checking over his shoulder, just acting nervous. My husband is pretty assertive and outright, and so just quickly asked him if there's anything going on we should know about. And the ranger got really quiet. You could tell he was a shy person, not really wanting to talk about whatever was bothering him. Just told us, and while looking us both in the eye, that if we plan to stay here, we shouldn't make it a long stay. Then, following that up with saying that many campers appeared to have problems while they were staying in this campground, and it's not like this campground was huge by any means. It's your pretty much average-sized campground. No bigger or smaller than any other one around the area. We kind of just looked at each other, shrugged our shoulders, and carried on our way. Said our goodbyes. We got set up, and there really was nobody else around. Which we thought was odd, but not too odd. Since this was a Tuesday, in the middle of the week. Traffic at campgrounds in the summertime during the weekdays are usually pretty nil, or next to nothing, depending on the campground. Although you usually do see at least a few people, I think we were the only ones there, and there were more than enough spots. It's usually Friday through Monday where all the heavy traffic is, so we just assumed that we missed all the heavy traffic. After getting everything unpacked and comfortable, that first night was a little weird. We heard strange sounds outside of our tent, just beyond our campsite. A weird raspy breathing, sniffing sounds. It sounded more like a big bear, which my husband was worried about, although he was pretty sure that Central Oregon did not have big grizzly bears. Black bears, yeah, but this sounded much larger. At one point, he had gone outside of his tent to go pee, instead of walking all the way to the bathroom which is at the other end of the campsite, he decided to just try and go behind our tent. About halfway in, he cut off his stream and came back in the tent all wide-eyed, said he believes there's something or somebody out there watching him. This caused me to feel a little on edge, considering I know how my husband is, and he's really not phased by too much. Even back when we were younger, and for a couple of months, stayed in this awful, cockroach-ridden apartment, but that's a different story entirely. He was pretty pale, wide-eyed, and breathing really quickly. I don't even think he slept much that night. Kept saying he felt like somebody was outside our tent. But I tried to assure him that everything was fine, and that we'd be okay. If anything, he did have his gun right in the car. That following morning, we got up early, just as the sun was rising. It was beautiful, 
as much of Central Oregon is, we made our coffee and decided to try and get over the fear of last night by going on a nice little nature morning walk. There was a trail right by our campsite, which went down to a little river. We thought that would be a perfect way to relax and to get rid of all the bad thoughts from the previous night. After eating breakfast and drinking our coffee, we go on the trail, and before we get down to the river, we notice an incredibly large scat pile right off the trail, maybe by three or four feet, like somebody just veered off the trail right there in the tall grass, popped a squat, and, well, did their business. Although, the problem with this is at first, I thought it'd be bear scat, but my husband, who decided to inspect it further, told me it was not bear scat. In fact, it looked a lot like human scat, except much, much larger. We also noticed a thick, musky trash odor all throughout the trail, on and off. We weren't sure what to attribute that to, since there were no dumpsters nearby, and we're pretty much in the forest. There's no reason why we should smell those things. We got down to the river, had a pretty normal day, tried to spend at least up until noon there, went back up and hung out at camp the majority of the day. That night, things got a little crazier. We began hearing screaming, shaking of trees, and at one point, a large tree near a campsite sounded like it had fallen over, starting with a huge bang, like a semi-truck running into a large oak tree, and the tree falling. My husband and I were screaming, because it was so loud in your tent. We had flashlights. We went out there and looked, but there was visibly no signs of any trees fallen, and the air was thick. It was very creepy. The best way I could summarize the feelings was that we were being closely watched by somebody or something, what I assume to be an animal, but I don't know. I feel that there was more than one if it was somebody or something. My husband might disagree, but we didn't talk about it much, so after having a second night of being completely exhausted from not sleeping well from the first night, we barely slept the second night at all, and getting up in the morning, we quickly had a very strong cup of coffee, got everything together, and we decided we weren't going to waste our time here anymore. There was just something off. Maybe these were the problems that that ranger had been talking about. As we were pulling out of the park, we waved to the ranger. We didn't waste any time with conversation or small talk. We got out of there and decided to go somewhere far away, at least by 70 or 80 miles, a little more north, where we felt we would be safer. I've told this story of mine to a couple of my close girlfriends. Some of them think it's very weird. Another one thinks we just heard stuff or that it could have been a bear. But my one friend is certain that we might have encountered a clan of Bigfoot I don't even know anything about Bigfoot, but since it could be a possibility that that is what we experienced, I thought I would reach out to you, since you might have answers, and you have a lot of videos on Bigfoot and weird creatures that aren't normal animals. But I don't know, maybe it could have just been a bear. I don't know too much about bears either, so hopefully with the details I've given you, you can clear things up for me. I used to work for the Maine Fish and Wildlife for a very short time, shortly after I got out of college. It was a pretty normal job. I didn't stay there long, but I did see something that I was told not to talk about, and this interest hasn't really gone anywhere until the past year, since quarantine. I kind of accidentally stumbled upon your channel, and I have to admit, I've gotten sucked in and I figured it was time to come forward with my own weird experience. Judging by your videos and your stories, perhaps this would be a dogman, but having no knowledge of this creature, I can't say for certain. All I can do, all I can do is give you an eyewitness testimony, and you decide from there what's truth and what's not. I was actually off work at the time, not on shift. The area of Maine that I was in is very rural, much like a lot of the state, and we do have big moose up there, and if you're not careful, they can decimate your tiny car. Unfortunately for me, I had a tiny Toyota Camry. It wasn't really going to stand anywhere up to a moose. 
but luckily I was never hit. But in front of me, about 20 feet, one of the largest moose I'd ever seen comes barreling out of the woods to my left, runs across the road, and into the forest to my right. Upon seeing this, I had already slammed on my brakes, but what was giving chase to it is what alarmed me. Following, not even two seconds after this moose disappeared into the woods on my right, four incredibly large wolves on all fours, black like jet black, came barreling after it, paying no attention to my tiny car. They were well on the hunt. After they crossed, I thought to myself, I had no idea Maine even had wolves, let alone wolves that size. These were wolves you'd see on like something of Game of Thrones, a fantasy show or TV, where it's not even meant to exist. Or I think they call them dire wolves. Massive wolves you could ride. I don't know if you're familiar with any of the Warcraft universe, or any of the World of Warcraft games, but the wolves kind of resembled the wolves in that game. I believe they're called wargs, and just like the ones in that game, they had extremely, almost tusk-like teeth coming out of the front. Very similar head too. Very large head. But their bodies were more sleeker, more slender as they tapered off on the back, and the arms and forearms were incredibly long, while the back legs were very muscly, almost kind of acting like a spring. They didn't run like a typical wolf does, or like a dog does. They had more of a hop to their run. Forgive me, as I'm trying to do my best to accurately portray and depict this scene in front of me. All four of them, roughly the same size. Even though they went by so fast, I got a look for a couple of seconds. It was around 5 or 4 p.m. The sun wasn't quite setting just yet, but still set in the sky where there was enough shadows cast that it didn't fill me in on every detail. But what I could see is that they were hot on this trail, chasing this moose. I wasn't initially frightened by the actual sighting, although I was a little bit disturbed by how large these wolves were, larger than anything I'd ever been taught, larger than anything that I thought even existed. So I'd asked some friends and colleagues about large wolves, and if they knew anything about them. I had told a couple of colleagues, and they kind of just shrugged their shoulders, not really knowing what it was. A few days later, I actually got called into the office by my supervisor, who sat me down and asked me that he believes that I saw something the other day, wanted me to elaborate on what it is. I told him exactly what I just told you. He got very stern, very serious, almost angry with me, and I remember him telling me that it's in my career's best interest to not say anything to anybody about it and to just act as if nothing happened. Puzzled, I wasn't quite sure what he was getting at, or why this was some thing that I should keep quiet. He refused to answer any questions I had, though. Then he sent me on my way. I wouldn't stay with that job much longer, due to dating a girl who was states away, and eventually moving, and finding a different career altogether. But it's still an experience that I've had that's very strange. And now that I've kind of been sucked into your channel, and learning all about these cryptids, it does pretty much match up to what I saw, at least the dogmen, based on your descriptions. But if anything is like your stories prove, I'm glad they didn't target me, because I'm sure I would have been dead. Back in the late 1980s, during my high school years, I would often spend time after school goofing off with friends, graffiti, getting into mischief, and smoking a lot of cigarettes. Hell, I probably chain-smoked more than ever in my life, and for whatever reason, thought I was so cool doing it. In fact, me and three of my close friends would always meet up in this tiny little secluded wooded area just a few miles north of our house, always after school. I was a late bloomer on getting my license, so it's not like we ever drove around. Just kind of walked, hid, and smoked cigarettes, talked crap about friends, school life, family, and other kids we did not like. Always having a cigarette. This would have been my senior year of high school. I remember 
because all throughout my high school, I gradually began smoking more and more until this point, which kind of killed it for me. So, in a way, I can kind of thank this experience for stopping my cigarette addiction because I was too scared to return to this location, really the only place that I felt safe smoking cigarettes, to be honest. My family, being extremely Catholic, had they caught me, I probably would have been beat with a belt. Yes, still, even at 17 years of age. So, anyway, back to the story. We're back here in this little wooded secluded spot, tucked far away from anybody else's attention or knowledge of where we are. In fact, only me and a few of my friends even knew about this spot. It's kind of off a small little trail, but tucked in just enough to where you wouldn't even know it had you not gone the way I went. And since this was long before cell phones or smartphones, I wouldn't even use a payphone. I would often just tell my parents before school, hey, I'm going to go hang out with my friends after school and be back a little after dinner. And they were always pretty cool with it. Luckily, now that I've kind of set up the story and the background, we're sitting there in our little area, smoking a cigarette, talking crap, when all of a sudden, I felt the forest get really quiet around me. I shouldn't say forest. It's not like we were in the middle of nowhere in a dense, green, lush forest like you probably are thinking. It was kind of a wooded area, but it wasn't so much extremely dense like you would think. I don't know. Maybe like a national forest. This is more like a wooded area that was kind of cleared, at least the part we had come from and behind us was a little bit thicker. Lots of brush and briar, thorns and all that. It was May or June, just about ready for graduation, so all the foliage was back in full bloom, making it very thick and muggy. And due to this, visibility wasn't the greatest, but you could still generally see around you. Like, if somebody was approaching us from the north, we could see even though we were a little bit hidden behind the bushes and stuff. We were just in the middle of conversation when everything had gotten quiet. My friend was talking, and I remember shushing him and telling him to listen. We all kind of listened, and it was far too quiet. You could drop a pin on the ground and hear it. It was making me uncomfortable, and I remember asking why it had suddenly got so quiet. My friends and I were looking around, I felt like in unison. We were all expecting something to happen. What? We had no idea. Then, like a crescendoing noise, we heard something large on two feet begin to approach us from the north, right behind us. It was slow, but very steady. We all began to turn our attention towards that direction. It sounded like a huge giant slowly approaching us. Not a casual walking speed, or even running. Almost kind of like a small pitter-pattering, if that's making any sense at all. But you can hear the thud, or feel it. And whatever was making it had great weight behind it. After maybe a couple more moments of hearing this pitter-pattering coming closer, we could see, out of the denseness and whatever light there was during that time of day, which was getting near dusk, this large black shape coming toward us. That was it for us. I was so terrified. We all threw our cigarettes down and ran out of there as quick as we could. What scares us even worse is this figure pursued us. It went even faster. The further down the trail we got, and it even sounded like it was gaining on us. But whatever it was was intelligent enough to stay behind the majority of brush, so we couldn't really see it. It kept itself, or themselves, pretty well concealed, and the most we could ever see was a large black silhouette. I couldn't tell you if it had hair, or a head, or any really important details, just that it looked like a really large thing, or person, I guess. However, because it is about a three to four minute walk back to our little secluded spot, the sidewalk. This thing had plenty of time to gain on us, and at one point or another, felt like it could have reached out and grabbed one of us. Because my friends bolted off in front of me, 
I, of course, was the last one. The very one closest to whatever this thing was. And I'm telling you, I have never been more terrified in my life than I was in that afternoon. There were times that I swear it was right behind me, and I never looked back. I was living in a real-life monster movie, and too afraid to face whatever it was. We finally got down to the sidewalk and just grabbed our bikes without even looking, nearly stumbling and falling over on them, and it felt like we all went about 30 miles an hour on our bikes with how terrified and full of adrenaline we were. Once we got a little ways away, we stopped, took a breather, and kept checking behind us. We were now in a nearby neighborhood, about 5 or 10 minutes away from the sidewalk that you would use to take that little spot into the forest. We were scared, asking what that was. After a minute or so, my friend tried to calm us all down, saying somebody was just messing with us. But I told him, nobody is that large. Did you hear the weight behind it? And why would they or it chase us? The direction it came from is undeveloped land. As far as I remember, there was nothing out there. I think just woods for miles and miles. No houses or nothing. All the developed land and houses were to the east, west, and south of us, primarily the south, so there'd be no reason for anybody to be back there. I mean, it's not like anybody hunts back there or anything. And this was in May or June, so again, no reason why anybody should be back there. And also, I can't help but think of why somebody so large would be making such a loud sound. If somebody was trying to sneak up on us, why would they be thudding so loud? Had to weigh an enormous weight, since as it got closer, we could feel the vibrations on the ground. Just like in a video game or a movie, the thud, 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 and feel the shaking of the ground as this large, massive thing or person approached. It was the most terrifying experience I've had yet, as I explained to you, and in the grand scheme of things, in a positive way, I somehow kind of connected cigarettes to that experience, and it caused me to stop smoking after that. As far as what chased us out of the woods that day, I'll never know. I was probably seven or eight at the time this happened, and even though it's not necessarily a monster story, it still is a pretty crazy story when you hear it. So, I used to go play down by this small little creek with a couple of friends. By the way, I lived in a small town in north central Idaho, and we used to play by this creek just about every day in the summertime. Until one day, one of my friends brought his dog, whom he had had for a while, and at some point or another, I can't remember when or how, but the dog started digging something up that resembled a bone. Being seven, eight-year-olds, we thought it was the coolest thing in the world. We got sticks and began digging, only to come and find out that what the dog had found and what we had unearthed with our sticks was indeed part or a fragment of a human skull. We all screamed and freaked out, and I think my friend, I don't remember if he did it then, but somebody called the police, and it caused a full-blown investigation. I remember we were thoroughly questioned, asked how long it was there, you know, all the usual 20 questions that investigators ask. Anyway, as time went on, it turns out that a couple people were murdered a few years back, and both of their bodies were dumped in that same location where we used to play all the time as kids. I'm assuming that their bodies were buried right next to that creek, and we just so happened, or my friend's dog, just so happened to dig up part of the skull of one of the missing individuals. From what I had heard through the grapevine, both remains were discovered right there next to that river. Still kind of gives me goosebumps even to this day to think about it. I don't live in Idaho anymore, but I've thought about returning and just visiting that creek just for fun. After that happened, of course, my parents wouldn't allow any of us back there. Not to mention, it had become a full-on investigation, so we weren't really allowed to tamper with any of that. But even after all that ended, and they got the remains, and it was all closed off, we still weren't allowed to go back there. In 
In 2007, I went on a minor hunting expedition with my father while he hunted up in northern Canada. It was cold, harsh, but also an amazing experience to be out and one with nature. This wasn't the very first time I had gone out with my father either. He had taken me along several trips, but I'd never been in Canada, and I'd never been this far north, besides the actual hunting trip itself, which, for the most part, went amazing. There is one part that really disturbs me, and has never quite left my memory banks, because I think back to it often, realizing that we are not on top of the food chain, and in fact, far from it. We had discovered a large cave along a rocky outcropping against a mountainside. Upon going in, we noticed the thick smell of blood and death. That's when we saw there was a lot of blood coming out of the cave, as if something had bled and left the cavern. We thought this was strange, but it could have been from an animal of fight, potentially, and the injured animal leaving the cave. And after exploring just a wee bit further, my father and I made the most gruesome and disturbing discovery of that entire trip. So much so, that it still stands out in my mind, a fully grown grizzly bear, with its entire head and neck, completely ripped off. While we never found the head, the body was there, and with enough ample lighting, we saw the carnage that lay between us. In fact, there was so much blood that it was hard to even make sense of what had happened. It looked like there had been some sort of fight, although not much, since this grizzly bear clearly lost, and the head was missing. After looking, well, my father did most of the looking, I tried to keep myself from puking. The smell was pretty bad, and the body had been there at least a day or two, so it was stinking pretty bad. My father inspected the wounds, grossed out and curious, far more than I was, and told me that whatever had done this clearly had ripped the head off this bear, looking at the wounds and the way the flesh was torn. And of course there was so much blood, you couldn't make out exactly the tracks or anything, like what animal had come in here, or what exactly had happened. You could even hardly make out what kind of struggle there was. So his best guess was that this bear was in its den, and it did look like a bear den. Something came into the cavern and ripped this bear's head clear off its body. Then, whatever it did with the head, we don't know. But that would explain the massive blood trail leading out to the entrance of the cavern and disappearing once it got to the dirt. It stunk pretty bad in there. Also looking around, we found small animal bones and just general signs you would of a general bear den. It was a large, but fit just enough for a bear. It's safe to say we were pretty smart about our findings and left the cave and left that part of the area the rest of the day. And for the remainder of that trip, my dad and I would always discuss back and forth what has the power to go in and kill a grizzly bear? Not only that, but rip its head clean off its body. Oh, and I don't want to forget to add that my dad thoroughly spent enough time looking at the body while I kind of stood outside, trying to get some fresh air, really trying to inspect everything that went on. He said he pretty thoroughly observed its body, saw no scratches, tears, cuts, bangs, broken bones, it's as if whatever came in there just came in the cavern, barely even fought the bear, ripped its head off, and left. The bear was found lying on its side, or at least its body was, so it doesn't appear to be much of a fight or struggle. Something came in there and overpowered an adult male grizzly bear. Now you tell me, what on earth has that kind of power? Normally, I don't really believe in things that go bump in the night or even things in the paranormal realm, but I can't dismiss how incredibly creepy and eerie this one night was when I worked for the forest service industry. It was in the evening time, and I was informed by a group of young kids in their early 20s, probably college age, that their friend had been missing since noon. They hadn't been able to find him, and they asked me for help. They said they were hiking along the trail and they pointed to me the trail head. 
they asked if I can help look for him. I explained to them that it is very common for someone to easily wander off the trail in search of going to the bathroom or maybe exploring and very easily losing their sense of direction if they don't have a compass or any form of equipment that will help keep them on track. As we began our search, it was just now getting dark, just about sundown. As we got about two miles down the trail, heading to the spot where they said to have lost him, we all heard audible screaming to our three o'clock. I veered off the trail, letting them follow behind me if they wanted to, but I think they stayed behind. They did not have the adequate equipment, and it wasn't safe. So I go down there, and I hear this screaming, yelling for help. I figured it's the lost hiker. So I keep going in a little ways, keep searching more and more through the forest. At this point in the path, in the woods, it's very dense, so I have to kind of make my way the best I can. I'm getting closer and closer to the screaming, and it's very clear that the person screaming is in distress, and they're screaming for help. I get closer, and it sounds like this person is only maybe 30 meters away at most. And then I come to a small clearing, where the screaming and yelling has now ceased entirely. I looked around, didn't see anything, didn't see any more signs of anybody being in the area or yelling for help. But I did find something disturbing. In the middle of the clearing was a large pine tree with what appeared to be a very weathered, dirty old human skull just casually sitting there at the base of the tree. Upon my finding, I radioed it in, and before we know it, we had an entire team out here looking for this lost hiker. I'll spare you all the irrelevant details, but it turns out the lost hiker had only wandered off the trail maybe a quarter of a mile, and being a good hiker and knowing proper technique, he stayed put and did lose all sense of direction, by the way. But here's what doesn't make sense. He wandered off way later on in the trail, off to our nine o'clock, not at all in the same direction or area that I had heard the screaming or yelling from. But here's the kicker. While I made this statement about the whole paranormal thing at the beginning of my story, I was told that the skull that was found at the base of that pine tree, maybe no more than a half mile off trail, actually belonged to a 39-year-old male hiker who had disappeared three years prior and was never found. Upon digging around that area in search of his remains, no other parts of his clothing, bag, equipment, or body was ever uncovered. Just his skull, casually sitting there at the base of the pine tree, as if somebody had found it and sat it there. I have no answers as to who was screaming and why they were yelling for help. It did sound like an adult male, and it sounded like that screaming and yelling was coming from that exact clearing that I found the skull. There had been no other reports of anybody missing, and nobody else had been hiking in that area of the trail. Nobody would be out there in the middle of the woods without the right equipment. It just made my entire skin crawl. I'm not going to claim to be the most knowledgeable and experienced park ranger there have been, but I've definitely seen my fair share of craziness being on the job. Everything from dead junkies to crazy search and rescue parties, you name it, I've probably seen it. Even though only working in the career field for nine years, I saw more than enough to get my fill. So in order to pursue school, I had to quit the job. I saw many horrific things that I will never be able to unget out of my memory, but there are other things that I encountered that will always shake me because there's no reasonable explanation for what I heard or what I saw. In fact, I can tell you many of them, but one that sticks out to me is finding certain dead animals in very specific conditions. For example, I once found a black bear dead in the middle of a small clearing. After searching for clues to how it died, it had a large gaping hole punched into its chest. Something with immense force punched a hole in this black bear's chest and ripped out its heart, dislocating and ripping open its ribcage entirely. That's something that I had no idea how to explain away, and it made me incredibly apprehensive into going into certain parts of the forest like I was supposed to especially during my routine patrol routes. 
I'll never forget that after that specific day, the entirety of the deer population in that small area seemed to vanish entirely, and I would always feel like I was being heavily watched when I'd go through that small section of forest, like something was just beyond the reach of me in the trees, watching me. I always try to be quiet and keep a lookout, make sure there was nothing following me or around me, and of course I never saw anything, but I can never shake the feeling, and I never did exactly find out why I felt so uncomfortable. I even had a colleague brush it off and tell me that there's pot growers out there, and that's why I felt so uncomfortable. Except a pot grower does not punch a hole in a black bear's chest and rip out its heart. I had some other colleagues who were a little bit older and wiser. They'd been on the job for a while. They always told me to be careful in that specific section of the forest as I patrolled. I can never get anything specific out of them, like what or why. I'd even told them my experiences with the black bear, which many of them were not surprised, and they reported too, having similar findings of such disturbing nature, always being extremely careful to what they would reveal to me and what they would keep hidden. So I never found out exactly. I have so many stories that if I wanted to, I could sit down and write to you. So I think I might take some time and sit down and take a trip down memory lane. But for the time being, just know that it's probably not the greatest idea to just go randomly waltzing into the forest. Even we forest rangers are aware that there's things in the woods we should be concerned about. We have a friend who's a volunteer who does search and rescue in the Australian outback, involved in wildlife rescue, bushfire management, etc. He had received a call about a couple of tourists who got in their heads that they could load up a little rented car with some snacks and tunes, drive it across the Australian bush. Some romantic idea about driving from Western Australia to the Northern Territory, looking for kangaroos in their habitat, foraging for native plants as bush tucker. No understanding of the rough terrain, isolation, good luck finding a gas station, and how cold the bush becomes at night. Their friends had not heard from them in several days, my friend is near Alice Springs, which is one of the locations they could have ended up. It's a lot of ground to cover, but he does his part and spends the day just driving around on dirt roads, and gets past familiar farms into the real outback, just miles of red dust and dry air, and doesn't find a broken down car, tourists, or anything but endless trees and shrubs. It's getting dark so he turns around to head home. On his way back, he notices something about one of the low-growing trees that he did not discern before. Hair. Human hair. Tufts of blonde hair are twisted around its branches. It's probably too light to be from indigenous people, and there is not a known tribe on that land regardless. He slows down. More hair. At least a dozen trees are decorated with locks of blonde hair, and he can't tell if they're speckled with red dirt or blood. When the gravity of the situation truly sunk in, he floored it. Frantically, radioing in to the shack in town, says he probably sounded crazy or drunk, lived in the country all his life, but swears that he'll never visit the outback at night again without another volunteer accompanying him. I was attached to a technical search and rescue team after Hurricane Irma impacted my county. Basically, we were the crews that go out after the winds die down and clear roads, search damaged structures just to make sure everybody is okay and even tend to those who are not. My county is one of the largest in the state of Florida. So, each team had multiple large grids to search through and that means going up and down every single street in every single neighborhood so that everything is covered and you don't miss a thing. So it took all day just to do a couple of grids. At one point, my team had up on a home with a large tree that had fallen onto the roof. 
like all the other large trees on roofs in the area. We would walk up, survey the damage, see if anybody was inside, and report it back. Nobody was home, so we just reported it and moved on. Went further down the road, but it was all flooded out, so we had no choice but to turn around and come back the way we came, passing the house above. On our way back around, the family, parents and two young children, had just gotten back from evacuating further inland, so we stopped and chatted with them for a bit, called in some linemen to take care of the power since there was a power line that went down. They invited us in to do some paperwork so we could connect them with social services and get them to a safe place to stay until their home situation is sorted out. While inside, we got a closer look at where exactly the tree had fallen. It was right above their kids' shared bedroom. The kids both slept in a bunk bed in a room in the corner of the house where the tree had fallen. The tree in question had a branch which penetrated the roof and ceiling of the room and had also gone clean through both the top and the bottom bunks. Had the family not evacuated, that tree fallen while those kids were in bed, since the storm came through overnight in the area, those two young kids would have been impaled in their sleep and more than likely lost their lives. They were very lucky deciding to evacuate, even though they're not in any evacuation or flood zone. After all the reports were in, overall, our county only had about 500 structures damaged from either wind, debris, or water. So we all lucked out, compared to some of the other parts of the state, and especially since nobody in our county was killed. We got pretty darn close. I'll keep this brief, but I used to do some pretty heavy-duty search and rescue operations back in the early 2000s, and while there are many stories that stand out to me, one, in particular, of a little four-year-old boy named Cody Rowler, his disappearance will always shake me. Here's why. He was just spending the day with his family, his mom, dad, and older brother, when the parents turned their backs on him, and the next second he was gone. A search was put out, and the entire area was surveyed for miles and miles. Well, after nine days, he was not found. But on the tenth day, 19 miles away, high up on a cliff, in over a 70-foot-tall pine tree, his shoes had been discovered, completely clean, as if the day he had been lost. We were able to confirm with the family that these shoes were indeed his. Again, completely clean, as if they were brand new and had never been worn. As it turns out, the parents had just bought him those shoes days before he went missing. They were a small pair of Nikes. I don't remember the size, but on the bottom of the left shoe, written in blue Sharpie, was his name, Cody Rowler, which is exactly how we were able to properly identify those shoes. I don't know how much you've ever read of any of the missing 411 stories, but this was my own personal missing 411 story. How a young four-year-old boy went 19 miles in a 10-day span and never once got his shoes dirty while going up a 100-plus foot steep cliff and even up more, a 70-tall foot pine tree. Nothing else of him was ever discovered. Only his shoes. That was honestly probably one of the hardest days on the job, having to tell the family what we had found. I believe the year is 2002, but it could have been 2003. It was somewhere right in that window of time. And to think, after all these years, those memories will never leave you. I was told this story in the early 1980s by a park ranger. I will repeat it to the best of my recollection. I live in eastern Washington just about an hour from where the Paul Freeman video was actually made. In the early 80s, I was elk hunting just a few miles from the Mill Creek watershed and by chance bumped into a ranger along the road whose job it was to patrol the watershed. The watershed is several thousand mountainous acres with heavy timber and very steep ridges. All of it is off limits to the public because it provides drinking water to the city 
of Walla Walla. We began talking about Paul Freeman, and eventually, I asked him if he had ever seen a Bigfoot. He said, No, but I did have an interesting experience. He told me that one day in the wintertime, he was driving up the mountain alongside the watershed perimeter on the Washington side. Part of the watershed is in Oregon, part Washington. It was snowing, and as he climbed up the mountain, the snow got deeper, and eventually, he was driving through fresh snow with no vehicle tracks in it other than his own. He continued on for some distance before parking the vehicle and deciding to do some walking along the watershed boundary. Now, apparently, it was here, all alone in a snowstorm, that he ran across fresh Bigfoot tracks down a steep trail and leading into the watershed. No vehicles in the area, no sign of people, no chance of anybody seeing the tracks, and yet there they were. I do not know the name of the ranger, and that I was in my 20s. He looked like 40s, so I'm sure he's long retired. I will also add that he was somewhat skeptical of the whole Bigfoot idea, but he could not give an explanation for the life of him for the tracks. He had absolutely no reason to lie or exaggerate, and even to this day, I 100% believe his story. Not exactly a park ranger story, but it does involve a park ranger. It's the scariest story that I have, and I was camping in northern Michigan with my dad. My grandma lived on a lake in a house near Gaylord, Michigan, which my parents and I would frequent every Friday through Sunday for well over a decade until my grandmother sold the place. Our routine would be to pack up all necessary equipment for a three-day camping trip, fit it into our trucks, grab the mountain bikes, and head off to one of the state forests. We then would find a random two-track leading into the woods. Particularly, we always aimed for those that looked like they haven't been driven on in years due to overgrowth. Find a place to park, offload bikes, and leave. Generally, made our own trail when we could. The goal was to find a stream or river and set up camp in any clearing we could find. Usually, ended up just in a clearing as we never went more than 10 to 15 miles from the truck. One time, we actually came across an old fountain of what I'm assuming was once an old home. No trailer road remotely near for miles, right on a stream, made of rocks about the size of a brick. There was a small wooden shack, I don't know, maybe ten or so feet from the foundation, maybe four or four and a half feet tall. I remember my dad had to bend over, and I just hunched, I was a kid, to get inside. Inside were rusted out gun barrels galore, fishing poles, snowshoes, bedding, old pots and pans. Clearly, the area hadn't been used in a very long time. Just cool stuff for a 12-year-old kid. We set up camp about 20 feet away, caught a few bullfrogs and cooked them up for dinner, along with some pan-fried nachos on the small Coleman that we had. You know, with those old-school mini-propane tanks. No light pollution. The night sky was amazing. You could see so many stars. To this day, my favorite part about camping is after dark. That night, shortly before we went to bed, we tied up all of our food and hung it up about 15 or so feet in the air over a branch, like you see in the movies. It keeps bears and other animals out of it essentially, our normal nightly routine. Shortly after we zipper the tent up to get some sleep, we started hearing grunting and huffing sounds coming from across the creek. Dad being an avid hunter, says it's likely a deer or elk, maybe a bear, which we have seen all these and more on our trips. Sound does carry pretty far, so Dad wasn't too concerned. We hear it throughout the night, 
but the sounds began getting almost baby-like. The only way I can describe it is imagine a baby whining softly. Add this with very deep huffs and grunting. Periodically, we would hear a high-pitched, sharp, but very short cry. Sounded to me like a baby screaming. Just creepy. Throughout the night, these sounds come and go. Dad loaded the Remington, and I had my little 20-gauge small game ready to go, just in case. My first gun, and my first time taking it with us on one of our trips. We eventually fell asleep. We wake up to nothing too out of the ordinary, except a stench of rotting meat, like a dead animal. We figured an animal had died, and we just could smell it on the wind. We would come across Coyote Kill sometimes, or some other animals, so we really didn't think anything of it. We go outside to a beautiful sunrise, and the sound of flies. Dad just figured we lost the food, and the flies are on it now. Dad walks around back by the food bag, and stops abruptly, and just says, I still remember it very slowly. A what the... Behind our tent are three deer, strung up, skinned and gutted. The deer were hung on three different branches on the same tree our bag was on, which was untouched. Each head was cut off and set on top of the guts. Each head was pointed directly at our tent. No one around. No footprints. No blood trail. Nothing. Just three deer hanging by vine. No twine or rope. Vines. Dad grabbed the gun and went to try and spot tracks or blood. By the way, he is a phenomenal tracker and has been a guide on a few occasions for experience hunts in the Upper Peninsula. He found nothing. We heard nothing in the night either. Incredibly creepy and disturbing. I was spooked. Dad was spooked too. As we packed up that Saturday and headed back to the truck. No incidents on the way back. Just a normal half-day trip back to the truck. Drove to DNR station and reported it. I just remember the guy looking at me. Then my dad. Shaking his head slowly and picking up the phone to call whoever. All we heard him say was something like, Another skinned animal sighting near the whatever stream. Clearly, it had happened before, but what is going on? Dad never did find out if it was somebody or something. The fact that my dad couldn't find any blood spotting or trails where those deer would have been dragged, or hoof prints where they were perhaps walked. Back in the early 2000s, for a few years, I worked in the forest industry. Much of that time involved me patrolling around my designated area as a park ranger. And although most days were mundane and boring and did not have anything exciting or worthwhile mentioning, there was a stretch of days that still deeply disturbed me. I was in an area where there are no reported bears, wolves, and hardly any cougars or mountain lions, which means that we have an abundance of deer and other wild game. This was in like 2002 or 3, so I don't know if that's changed since. But at the time, there was a lot of deer in the area. Then, one day, as if something radically changed overnight, I found at least nine different deer corpses in just a short area, all within about a two and a half mile perimeter of each other. Here's the problem. These weren't just dead deer, they were shredded apart. I'm talking ripped from limb to limb, as if something grabbed them by the two front legs and ripped them down the middle. Sometimes their spines would still be attached. Other times, it looked like something had beat them against a tree, torn their legs off, and grabbed their bodies and squeezed them till their organs popped out, or flat out just grabbed their skin and ripped them open. None of them looked like they died peacefully or pain-free. This went on for a series of about three or four days, and it deeply disturbed me. 
The first day, I found the nine. The second day, I found about two or three. And the last day, I found about another four. All does, no bucks. All having died in gruesome, horrible ways. I saw no evidence or traces of anyone, like a poacher or hunter, coming through the area. And I also saw no traces or tracks of any large mountain lion, cat, or anything. Besides, a hunter or a cougar does not kill this way, nor would they leave the meat or any of the body that way. These deer weren't even eaten on, just brutally killed, gutted, and torn apart, and then left there. All very fresh kills. I worked during the daytime, and it was evident that each day I would find these, the kills had to have been no older than 12 hours old. The other weird thing was, too, flies weren't even buzzing around these corpses. That's very unusual, especially for being at least 12 hours old. They were even hardly decaying. I still wonder to this day what came through and tore up all those deer, and why. If it was a person, what's the point? Why didn't they harvest any of the meat? Why did they degut it and just leave it? And if it was a cougar, why did it kill in such a way that was so destructive? So alien from any way that a cougar normally kills a deer? And of course, why didn't it eat any of the meat? I don't even believe this was a territory kill either. My guess is that all these deer were just suddenly attacked and killed. It doesn't appear as if they ran and hid. It's like they were just attacked and killed on the spot they were standing. I found a couple of them dead by a small stream nearby, as if they were drinking when they were attacked and slaughtered. There also wasn't a lot of blood, while there was a considerable amount of blood in each of the spots where they died, even though their death proved that they were thrown around or torn up. There wasn't a lot of gore or blood really anywhere in like a six-foot radius from their corpse. It was all very contained, furthering the theory that they were killed and torn apart in that exact small spot. One of the strangest things I've ever seen, as well as creepy and disturbing. This job isn't for everybody. In 2004, I took on a new career, although my career change actually had nothing to do with that series of days that I'm telling you about. It was actually due to moving and wanting to pursue a different path in life. I have to confess... I'm not sure what the creature was, but I can tell you it wasn't a bear. Here's my story. You decide. I'm watching a YouTube video just the other day, and it reminded me of when I was up in Western Virginia, a beautiful part of the country. Appalachian Trail passes very near the Roanoke and Craig County line. Just over in Craig County is the spot where Audie Murphy's plane went down and he was killed. I've hiked up to the site and seen the monument that marks the site now. This was back in the mid-90s. I had a friend who worked as a volunteer with the Craig County Emergency Services give me a call one evening. He explained they were organizing a search for a couple of hikers that were last reported going off trail to see the memorial. They're overdue and nobody has seen them. I never could say no to helping search for somebody who's lost. Someday, someone might be looking for me. It's a karma thing. Next morning, I get myself all geared up and out the door. It's a Saturday, and I drive to where he told me to meet up with them. We hook up, and while I'm about 20 years younger then, and I sort of make a visual survey around me, I think I've managed to count the other people my age who were there on the fingers of one hand, and darned if I didn't have any fingers left over. There were several county officers there. However, all but one of them didn't look like they could walk more than a couple of hundred yards. Sadly, too many stops at the donut shop. Now, let me say this. I don't mean any disrespect to law enforcement. No, not at all. Most police keep themselves in great shape nowadays, however. This is a little small county that doesn't pay much, and they sort of have to take what they can get, if you get what I'm saying. Can't have too many physical requirements, or they might not have any law enforcement. The rest, I swear, are 20-somethings, and about a quarter of them 
look like they should still be in high school. So I'm talking to Jimmy, and he says we're about to be briefed by the chief. Sure enough, as he finished saying the words, the chief, he comes out, and I almost snickered. The chief was the fire chief of the county, and when it came to search and rescue, he was the county coordinator. What I thought was funny was he was wearing a huge white fireman's ceremonial hat that had chief on it in huge letters. This was mainly due to the fire department having the best communication system in the county, even better than the 911. So, we form up in front of a large-scale map of the county. He points to it, gives us a rundown of what they know. Then, he sets about making up groups, as he didn't want anyone going off alone. He puts me in a group with young guys. The first thing going through my mind was, oh great, I'm a babysitter. So the chief is going around, giving various group area assignments, getting the names and addresses of everybody involved. He gets over to my group. We already have our information written down. He takes out his smaller map, assigns us an area. I have my map pouch with me, and I take out the map for the area he's assigned us, and I start marking it off my map. Then he says to me, You have your own maps? And I told him, Well, yeah. You got a compass? He said. Yeah, and my truck with my gear. Gear? You have your own gear? I was a little surprised. I said, yeah. And then I told him, Chief, this area you've given us to search will take the better part of the day, and that's assuming we don't have anything that happens to slow us down. He sort of smiled and asked what my background was. I told him I'm an engineer. He looked at me a little closer, like he was sizing up a horse he was going to buy. Told me, engineer, huh? Not much engineering out here. Asked me what kind of experience I had tracking. I almost asked him, is this an interview? And he told me he does a lot of hunting. I wasn't going to say Bigfoot, because I was pretty sure this old boy would have run me off as crazy. And I do a lot of trail hiking, I told him. I watched his eyes lit up. You do, huh? And so I nodded. Take a good look at your map, and tell me what you think these fellows might have done. I looked at the map for a bit and said, Well, we're last seen about here, which is where the parking lot is located. My guess is they probably made a straight course toward the monument, and most likely, they used the trail to hike up the monument. So then he asked me, You think they would have gone back the same way? I looked at him and told him, Nope. Hikers don't like looking at the same things more than once, as a general rule. My guess is the monument was just a jumping off point for them. Then he smiled at me and said, That's the way I figure too. Then I offered up. That part of Craig County is pretty remote. Heck, I mean, if it wasn't for old Audie Murphy getting himself killed out there, the odds are hardly anyone would be there. And then I paused. Chief, I know you've already thought about this, but how about shiners and pot growers? If those boys ran afoul of any of them, I'd bet we'll never find them. And so he looked at me. You think like I do, but according to the police chief, they don't have any activity in those areas because, while they're remote, it's no easy way to get supplies in there. You gotta have sugar, you gotta have corn, and you gotta have water. Not much of those in that area. And to make any money growing pot, you need fewer trees or the plants won't get sunlight. In about an hour, we all had our assignments and teams, so we drove down to the parking lot at the monument. It was a gravel road, as there was little traffic, and we all got out and started getting our gear together, and in just a few minutes, I was ready. Unfortunately, the other team members wanted to continue to talk to their buddies, the one guy with the radio, myself and two young fellows were ready. I looked over at them and said, Okay guys, we're out of here. They looked at me like I was speaking another language. They had a surprised look on their faces and said, Oh, we're not going back to the station. Now I had the odd look. Why would we be doing that? Then the one said, Because all our gear is back there. And so I looked at the other. Yours too? He just nodded with a dumbfounded look. 
I thought to myself, oh, geez. Well, you two go get your gear and get another assignment, because we don't have time to wait. Then the one guy said, we didn't know this was taking us to where to look. So I looked at him and said, no problem. Just get another assignment after you get your gear. I'm sure the chief will have plenty. And then they looked at each other, and then back at the friends they were paying so much attention to, and just laughed and shrugged. Then he turned back and said, Well, all we really need is water, and you got plenty of that. I cut him off. I don't carry water for others, nor do I carry gear for anyone but me. We have an assignment. Same one who you were supposed to have, only you didn't bring your gear. With that, I turned and said, Come on. There seems to be some in every crowd who thinks that this is just some game, and they don't have to pay attention. We came up to the monument, and I looked around. Not too much to see, really, as the trees were close in on us. I took out my map and said, Okay, we go this way. Just then, the guy with the radio said, Well, I'm in charge of this group. I looked at him and said, Okay, you're in charge. I put my map in my pocket and said, Which way do we go? He looked at me and asked if he could see the map. And so I asked him, You don't have a map. How are you going to lead us? He looked a little dumbfounded and said, Well, you have a map. I shook my head. Let me enlighten you. You are not in charge. You're the radio operator. How old are you? He sort of put his head down. Seventeen. I knew he was young, but not that young. Okay, you're probably not going to work. He just sort of shook his head and started with the radio check. At this point, I was beginning to wonder what we were going to do. I'd already had two children self-eliminate, and now suddenly, the guy with the radio thinks he's the one in charge. I looked up and said softly to the sky, What's next? So we head off, and it's not a bad drop-down. A little steep here and there, but really no big deal. Then, we get down to the bottom, and one of the guys is sucking wind like crazy. So I asked him what was wrong, and he's huffing and puffing so badly. I was wondering if maybe he was going to have a heart attack. He looked at me, with sweat pouring off of him, and he told me, That climb down was ungodly. Now I'm confused. We didn't have to climb anything. All we did was drop down, you know, with gravity sort of helping us. I wasn't breathing hard and haven't even broken sweat, and this guy was clearly messed up. Dude, tell me something. If you knew you weren't in any kind of shape to be doing a search for hikers, why are you here? He looked at me like I was crazy, because my buddies were coming to help out. I just told him, well, this you just did is nothing. In just a bit, we have to climb. That means go up. You think you're sucking wind now. I'm gonna go against gravity will kill you. And he got a look of sudden realization on his face. Why don't you go back to the parking lot and see if you can help them there, because you're just slowing us down. He looked up the mountain and back at me, and said, back up there, and started shaking his head, and got a very concerned look on his face. I can't make it. Not by myself. And this was getting ridiculous. I'm not going to carry you. We're supposed to be a six-man team. When you leave, we're down to three. That means we can't cover our search, but half the ground we're supposed to cover, because you shouldn't be here. The poor kid looked hurt, but honestly, he was exhausted from hiking down, and he was slowing us down, and he knew it. All you have to do is climb right back up the way we came. You can't leave me here alone, he told me. I couldn't believe this. Not only was he out of shape, but now he was turning into a sissy. So I stopped him. You aren't alone. You are 200 yards from the monument. There are people up there because that's where the guy who's relaying the radio communications for all the parties over here is located. It's a high point. How do you know that, he asked. Because we covered all this in the meeting we had with the chief. And you had better known that had you been paying attention. But suffice to say that I ripped off a tirade of things better not repeated here in a highly agitated state. Upon finishing, Bubba decided he could find his way back to civilization on his own. No problem. Suddenly, 
he found a lot of strength and was going uphill like it wasn't a huge problem at all. So as long as he can get away from me. So, now I walk back over to the other two and try to talk in a much calmer voice. Is there some problem or issue that you two might have that's going to prevent you from actually doing what we've come here to do? The two of them just begin shaking their heads. Do either one of you have some injury? Or maybe you're just not up for the task. Either one of you got your period, maybe. Or maybe you're sore. Then they were smiling. Okay, let's go. We've spread out, but stayed within eyesight at all times. A couple of times I had to shout to get one of them back, but in all of our search, it was going well. We'd covered a couple of miles and were taking a break. And of course, we were talking about what might have happened to the guy. And yes, this was long before the book, Missing 411, written by David Pilates. But it wasn't odd to have people disappear at all. One of the guys had asked if I'd ever been on a search and rescue before. And I told him, I was a hiker. And there's sort of an understanding that when people are needed to search for hikers, others will stop what they're doing and help out. The guy asked me if it happens a lot, and I told him it happens more than I think most people realize. But it's not uncommon for somebody to have to take a one or two break and step off a trail, take care of business, and then start walking to where they thought the trail was and suddenly, realizing they're lost. They looked like they didn't believe me. Seriously, guys. Then... What happens is panic sets in. Sheer, unadulterated panic. Abject fear. The kind that happens to little kids when they get lost in a department store, and they look around and can't find their parents. Now, I could see I was making a connection with them, because most of us all have gotten lost in a store. And really, they aren't far from their mom or dad. They just panicked. Same thing happens with adults. I'll tell you a quick story. Back in the day, when I was a Boy Scout, I was out with a couple of guys who were training for their map reading and hiking merit badges. I already had mine, so I was going out with them. It was a simple overnighter, about five or six miles out camp, and come back the next day to the same location for one of the guy's dads to pick us up. So what happens is we're following this one guy's navigation, and all is well, until he looks around says there should be an old cemetery here. Checks his map, suddenly freaks out. He has the wrong map, and he panics. Just goes off the deep end. He suddenly starts running like mad, crying, screaming, a total mess. I see what's happened, and I see the other boy is like almost in a trance state. I tell him to stay there and don't move. I dropped my pack, take off my runner, the good news is he started getting hot and tired and was dropping his gear and leaving a trail. I finally caught him and had to tackle him. He was fighting me. His eyes were completely glazed over. I seriously doubted that he'd have recognized his own mother at that moment. Finally, I had to punch him in the gut to get to break the panic. He coughed and everything. And finally, I got him up and we began walking back picking up his gear as we went. We got back to the other boy who was coming out of the trance, and I told them both, we are not lost. I explained that what we do is go back to where we started, and they both said that wasn't where the dad was going to pick us up. I told them then, when we're overdue, the father would check the other place before he got worried, and the next day, we got out, and just before dad got there, I told them there was no reason to worry and we did not need to talk about it anymore. The guys just sort of looked at me and said, being scared is a terrible thing, and panic will get you killed. It happens all the time. Right then, the radio began squawking, but we couldn't hear everything. So I told the guy to climb up higher and to see what he could find out. He kind of looked like he wasn't sure, and I said, do you need someone to go with you? He didn't give any indication just sort of looked up the mountain and back at me. I shook my head, told the other boy to go with him, but come right back here where they got some news. In about 30 minutes, they're coming back all excited. They'd found one of the hikers alive, but he was not able to speak or tell them anything. Okay, 
where'd they find him? I'd asked, as I was taking out my map. He told me, and I found the approximate area, which was about four miles ahead of us. Chief said he wanted us to spread out and come down this little valley. He pointed to it. That made good sense because that's sort of a natural path, the mountains. Okay, let's fan out, but stay in sight of each other at all times. Guys pay attention to what's around you and to each other so we don't give them another reason to have to search for us. We begin moving along the bottom, and it's pretty obvious that we really need more guys. And right now, I was wishing the guys I sent back were here now. But odds are, the guys who couldn't remember to bring their own gear, and the one guy whose idea of a heavy workout was sitting in front of video games. However, I took a second and said, Fellows, I know it's just us, so really keep your eyes open and search as best as you can. But no matter what, keep in sight of each other at all times. If one of you wants to move over to check something, tell the other guy so he can ease towards you. They gave an okay sign, and back to it we went. We looked for about an hour, covered about a mile, maybe a little more. All of a sudden, I hear, Hey, I got something here. Naturally, we collapsed into where he was, and sure enough, we had what appeared to be blood on the ground. Judging from the way the leaves were disturbed, something did happen here. I took up my map, located it as best I could. You have to remember that at this time, I didn't have a GPS locator. It was old-fashioned dead reckoning. The boy with the radio had said, I need to call this in. I looked at him. You're right but let's make sure there isn't anything else for us to tell him. He looked at me funny, but this was 30 feel from almost a vertical wall. Let's make a quick sweep and make a corner, and so we came around over and went around. First thing I noticed was a very distinct smell of a body. Not stinking, but if you hunt, you know what a kill smells like. I looked over at the guys and said, you smell that. They all nodded. We eased on around, and then one of the guys grabbed my arm, looking like he'd seen a ghost. I looked at him, saw him, then looked where he was looking, and saw what had shocked him. There on the ground was a severed head. All of a sudden, the first boy was about to heave, and I told him to go over there and let it go. Naturally, the radio guy comes over, sees it, and he starts heaving. I sent him over to puke with the other guy. I walked over and got a closer look. I was really glad the eyes were closed. That might have freaked me out. I looked around a bit and started to find clothing shreds and the rest of the body parts. I couldn't touch anything. But I really didn't have to. This guy's head and body had been completely deconstructed. Arms, legs, and head ripped pretty cleanly off the torso. Then the arms and legs were ripped apart at the knees and elbows, almost the way you'd cut up a chicken that you were getting ready to fry up for dinner. Then, I walked back over to where the guys were, about done heaving, asked them how they were doing. Radio guy was getting better and was actually helping the other boy. I forget their real names now, but the non-radio guy was still a bit white in the face, but was getting better. He looked at me. I ain't never seen anything like that. And I told him, you never will again. Then, I said to the radio guy, Now you need to call this in. I looked at the other boy and said, Can you go with him? He nodded. Okay, I'll stay here, but be sure that they understand there's no place for a helicopter to land. If they have to get people here quickly, they are going to have to do a rope insertion. Tell them, I have a smoke marker, and when we hear their engines, I'll light it. That will mark us. He looked at me a little wild-eyed, with adrenaline, shook his head. Okay, one more thing. Don't go into graphic detail on the radio. Just tell them we found a body, and they're going to need forensics. He looked at me like it was his job. You don't want that stuff being broadcasted out over the radio. Everybody with a police scanner will be on the phone to the press. That won't help. 
it'll just add another layer of BS the chief is going to have to deal with. He looked at me and nodded. Then he and the other boy headed off. I watched them head up to the top of the mountain and just sort of started looking, about to see if I could locate anything else. And the more I looked at the crime scene, the more I was bewildered. It was obvious that whatever had gotten a hold of this fellow had simply ripped him up like a ragdoll, just took him a part of the joints from what I could see. There was no obvious bite marks, no sign of consumption. Now I could touch anything and make a detailed inspection, but no bite marks. Then I noticed that I didn't see any claw marks either. I went over to the torso and not a single claw mark or bite mark to be seen. I got to looking at the wounds and can tell whatever it was that got this boy had ripped him to pieces. The wounds weren't like nice clean cuts. They were like ripped off by something with great force and at great speed. I walked back over to the bloody mess we found at first and I walked down the other way a bit. I hadn't looked down here because they found the head. As I looked around, I saw something lying on the ground up ahead. I walked up to it, saw it was a backpack, still buckled like it would have been on a person, but covered in blood. Okay, there's his backpack, I had thought. So I made my way back over there, sat down on a rock, and began trying to put it all together. I took out my thermos of coffee, poured it into the cup, took a sip, Still a nice temp. I just couldn't get my head around it. A bear would have left bite marks and wounds and claw marks and would have most likely eaten the torso, internal organs and all. Bears don't care if it's a human or an animal. To them, we're just another meal. Then I got to thinking. The only thing that could have done this was a bear. But we only have black bear in this area. And this looked nothing like a bear attack. Bears will kill something and come back later to eat it. They really enjoy rotting meat and will often kill something and let it sort of get ripe then come and eat it later. But not one claw mark and not a single tooth mark. Not only that, but sadly, I have seen bear attacks before on humans. This doesn't look like what I've seen in the past at all. It almost is like something big and strong got pissed off at this fellow took out its wrath on him, tearing apart the thing and all the large joints, like it had to take the strength of a large, severely pissed-off gorilla. Then, there's the backpack, two or three hundred yards away, still hooked up like it was on the guy, covered in blood, no sign of tooth or claw. I remember I began feeling a little uncomfortable, reaching down, took out my trusty forty-five and racked the slide. While I was far from scared, I was uneasy. Felt better feeling I was more ready. I slid my pistol back into its holster, checked the safety. I didn't close the flap so I can draw and fire quickly if need be. I'm not normally skittish, but I have to admit, with the boy all ripped apart and no clear idea of what did it, I just felt uncomfortable. I guess about 30 or so minutes later, the two guys came down all excited, and both of them talking at the same time, and each oblivious to the other talking. I told them, slow down, one at a time. They were still trying to talk over each other, and I finally got them to settle down. Chief said he's sending a whole team out here by helicopter. Then the other boy kicked in. He said it's going to be one of those military choppers from Fort Pickett or Langley. They're going to drop down by ropes, and they're going to bring all the gear. And Chief said they was going to pick us up and get us back so we could tell our story to him. The dude was so excited that I think if I had checked, he'd have been a had wood. Just wide-eyed excited. When they think they're close to us, they're going to call us on the radio, and that's when you need to set off the smoke. Got it, I said. Bless his heart. I don't think he's had this much excitement in his life. Okay, so how long before they get here? Radio guys spoke and said, Chief said it might be a couple of hours. They gotta get everything loaded and get here. 
and then they'll need to refuel in Roanoke. Honestly, I didn't think time could pass any slower, and these two guys were high as a kite from adrenaline. Have to admit, I might have been them at that age, too. But we finally heard the distinct sound of a chopper, and I got up my smoker right as the radio came to life. Tell him we hear his engines, and we're popping red smoke to mark his best drop point. Radio guy was telling him, and set off my smoker, and watched a large plum of smoke come out of that thing, like it's nobody's business. Then, the helicopter parked over us. Down came the guys on ropes like professionals. Down came more guys, and then gear. Then the chopper moved, and another started dropping gear and more guys. It was a sight to behold. First guy came over and asked me where the body was. It was hard to hear him over the rotor and the helicopter. We took him over, showed him everything we'd found, and of course, he wanted to know if we'd touched anything. We told him no. Also told him where my two guys puked. They looked embarrassed, but better than getting tagged as a suspect. Then the choppers flew. I looked at him as the roar died down. That's better. Looks like we're walking out then. Nope, you guys get to fly out. They need to get refueled first. They started doing a proper sweep, as they had more people than we did. And we just got out of the way. Let them do their thing. In a bit, the guy came over again and said hello, and was coming back up. So get ready. They'll be here in about 20 minutes. Sure would be curious what it was that attacked that guy. I'd asked him. Oh, it's a bear attack, no question about it. I looked at him like he was crazy. Partner, I don't want to sound like I'm telling you to do your job, but I've seen bear attacks. This isn't a bear attack. He smiled, and I recall it was an odd one to me. Oh no, this is a bear attack. Almost textbook case. I looked at him and said, BS, that's not a bear attack and we both know it. He kept on smiling. That's what it will be put down as, is what he said. Then he turned and walked off and his large sergeant came over and said, Come over here, sir, and let's get you ready for extraction. The chopper came and flew us back to the building. This is where we'd all started from. The first person there was the chief. He took us inside and into where the offices were and introduced us to the county chief of police. He then took our statements. Actually, he gave us sheets of paper and pens and told us to write down our experience. The two boys with me were done in 20 minutes, and they only wrote like half a paragraph. Badly, really badly. I said to them, Guys, this looks like it was written by a 7th grader. You realize this is going to be seen by real agents and police. I have to admit I was shocked at how badly they had written it up. We get there, and he was dead, all over the place. I just shook my head and said, If you're good with that, then give them to the chief. I finished mine. It was ten pages long. So I took and gave it to the chief. He read it over. He gave the other two back their statement and told them they need to do a better job of writing reports. Here, read this report. And he handed them mine. That's what a report is supposed to look like. Then he said to me, You live in Roanoke, right? And I told him I did. All right, thank you for your help. You're free to go. But this is an ongoing investigation, so don't talk about anything you've seen. If you can, it'll land you in jail. I wrote everything about no teeth marks, no claw marks, no cut wounds, and he read it like it was in the sports page of the local newspaper. I took off my gear and started out toward my truck. I heard the chief call to me. He came out, walked to my truck, and he said, Do yourself a favor. Don't talk about this. Just trust me on this. I looked at him and said, What are you guys covering up here? That is not a bear attack, and you know it. That's not a bear attack, and you know it. There are no bite wounds, and sure, no claw marks on that boy. He was torn apart by something strong. On top of that, if it was a bear, it would have eaten some of him. Chief just held up his hand. Just take my word for it. And if it makes you feel any better, I could use a good man like you in the future if we have any more disappearances. 
I looked away, then back at him. Fine. Call me if you want. I wrote down my number for him, handed it off. I watched the news the next morning, and I saw a quick blurb about how the missing hiker were found. One boy is in the hospital, and the other was found dead. No foul play is suspected. The sighting occurred in a high-elevation park meadow in the Fan Creek drainage in Yellowstone's northwest corner. The first time I had heard anything was in the mid-late 70s. An outfitter and I were riding up Fan Creek in the northwest section of the park, up the drainage into Stellaria Creek. We heard a sound that just kept going and going. It was probably a mile away. It filled the entirety of the valley, kind of a thousand-like elk going to their death. I couldn't believe this thing had that much volume for that long a period of time. He had never heard anything like it, neither. A couple of weeks later, I was coming out from Sportsman Creek, taking a trail which comes out of Fan Creek. I was 11 miles back in, up high in Supple Pine for a meadow complex. I was on a steep side hill with horses and in woods, but down below, about 40 to 50 yards, there was a kind of fairly flat meadow with dense thickets. There were these low fir growths that have a centerpiece tree and then everything kind of cone shapes to ground. They were about 20 yards wide or so. The horses were flaring their nose and snorting, like they do when a grizzly bear is real close. But I could see fairly good all around, and I could not see one. So I began looking down below me, and the horses were really agitated. They're wanting to get out of there. I held them, but only with effort. I looked down to see where Grizz was, and I saw a deer at the edge of the thicket. All at once it bolted and started jarring ahead, perpendicular to me. Right then, coming out of the other side was this thing that was running on two feet. It was black like a bear, and it had long arms and ran. I think I held it there 30 seconds, but it got scared and then came out. It ran, but not super fast. It ran to another thicket and went at an angle out of the thicket to another thicket, about 40 to 50 yards away. At this point, the creature was 75 yards downslope. It kept hitting these thickets, trying to get away from me. I've never seen a bear do that. They'll always take a straight line. The first thing I thought was bear, but right away, I realized that this black shaggy thing wasn't a bear. This thing was smart. I've never seen an animal trying to pick up protection as it fled. I tied that together with sound on the other side of the drainage. It wasn't that tall either. It looked like it was six foot, maybe six five. The side of the face looked like it had a lot of fur. And most of the time, it was angling away. So I only got a good look at the head for probably the first ten steps. The proportions of the torso, it looked more stocky than anything else. I noticed the arm swung more than a human's would, and it did not have elbows cocked. This was no hoax. I've ridden maybe 50,000 to 70,000 miles in the backcountry on horses, and trust me, you encounter a lot of bears when you do that. This thing, whatever it was, the horses looked straight down to it. One guy I had met in the northeast section of the park, he was camped illegally. He said he had heard a noise really close to him. I made him describe it to me. He said it was probably within 20 yards. One other outfitter heard that also. That would be back in the early 80s for both of those. Another time, a crew examining the blister rust, which is a disease of white bark pine in the 1970s, came on an elk in the southeast corner of the park. They came on an elk and saw these big real footprints. 
they kind of got scared and headed out. On that same trip, they heard really weird noises up near Mountain Creek. One time, I was skiing into Hart Lake on the thoroughfare. We were five or six miles east of the road, and myself and the others, all at once, we saw these footprints going across the trail. There wasn't any path, and no one used to ski that far in back then. These were real big footprints and stretched out far apart. It was deep snow, but it was a fairly distinct track. That was the first and only track I've seen. In the early mid-80s, in some drainage as Mountain Creek, we were just coming into the Howl Creek Cabin near Eagle Creek Pass at 8,500 feet. We were coming in right before dark, and we heard that noise. I timed it at 26 seconds, about 300 to 400 yards beyond the cabin up the drainage. I checked the next day and couldn't find any footprints. But whatever that thing is, it doesn't let up to take a breath. As far as the sounds, it's mechanical, rhythmical. I can't even begin to describe it. It isn't like a mountain lion or a bear, and a bear can make some pretty weird noises. I heard no other reports of Bigfoot until three to four years ago. I was in Mountain Creek and heard this thing again. A district ranger once took sighting from a backpacker near Balula Lake. That would have been in the 70s, west of the south entrance. Apparently, the person watched one on the other side of a small lake for 10 minutes. The ranger felt the witness was very sane. The sighting was witnessed by my friend and myself, both geologists, while driving into Yellowstone from Cody for employment at the park for the summer. My friend was taking his turn at driving, and I was soaking up as much as I could see, as well as providing a running commentary to keep my friend alert during our very long drive. As we came around a curve in the road, our high beams illuminated a large, dark, shaggy figure coming up out of the ditch on the left south side of the road at a distance of roughly 200 to 250 feet. As we approached the figure at a speed of about 45 miles per hour, it looked first at the vehicle. We noticed the yellow reflection from its eyes that is seen in dog's eyes when light catches it at night then deliberately turned its head away from the lights. That motion was non-human or bear-like, in that the shoulders, chest, and head moved simultaneously as it caught sight of our vehicle, then turned its face away from the headlights. We slowed. Okay, we slammed on the brakes, stunned at what we were seeing and tried to rationalize what we were looking at. A hominid creature perhaps seven and a half feet in height. We have a seven-foot friend as a reference, massing perhaps 600 to 800 pounds without obvious signs of obesity, standing completely and comfortably upright, came up out of the ditch from the left side of the road, right at the edge of the metal barrier above the culvert. It took three extraordinarily long and fluid strides across the highway, which is measured at 22 feet, and another three to four shorter strides down the other side of the road, actually appearing to catch hold of the metal barrier with one long, fingered, hairy hand, and swinging down under the road into the box culvert, or channel bottom, completely out of our line of sight. We stopped the vehicle within 25 feet of the culvert and watched as the final descent of the creature went off into the darkness of the channel. At this point, we sped on towards the east gate of YNP, hoping to find a ranger to report the sighting to, perhaps to go back and take another look. There was no one at the gate due to the late hour. We didn't see any lights on anywhere, so we continued on to our destination, went to bed, deciding not to contaminate each other's observations with discussions until morning time. In the morning, we both independently described graphically 
and in writing, as much as what we could have seen six hours earlier. This is a synopsis of our findings. They were virtually identical, down to the movement of which leg moved first as the creature crossed the road. The head appeared to merge into the neck, and there was no snout or protrusion from the face as would be commonly seen in a bear. Trust me, I've seen hundreds, up close and in person. This was not some misidentity. The face was not clearly visible, and was only glimpsed for a moment. We both got an impression of long hair covering some of it. The nostrils were large and open, but neither of us were able to describe mouth or teeth. The eyes weren't exceptional, just the reflection of gold, like a dog's. What each of us can still describe, with great clarity in the size, shape, and unique fluid movement of the creature. It was big, seven to seven and a half feet tall, but not much bigger than that. It was heavy and powerful looking. In shape, it possessed a rather blocky, yet elongated head, slightly domed on top of the cranium, thick short neck, broad shoulders, full chest. It was square, and longer through the torso and hips than a human is. As it walked across the road in front of us, the buttocks was clearly seen as a muscular mass moving under heavy, shaggy hair. They obviously attached to a long, powerful, muscular thighs, longer in proportion to a human, big knees that functioned as a human knee, thick, muscular calves, and feet in proportion to the rest of its oversized body. The soles of the feet appeared to be hairless, or less hair covered in hair, and very dark in color. The arms hung from heavily muscled shoulders, and were longer than a human, reaching to knee length, and extending fully, almost a horizontal position to the front and rear of the body as it moved. The elbows were perhaps a little further down the arm than on a human, or the unusual length of the arm made it appear so. The hands were large and long-fingered. Neither of us could later describe the palms, nails, or other than the backs of the hands which were covered in the same long, shaggy, dark brown hair as the rest of the creature. The creature made no sound nor gesture through the entire sighting. It appeared a little startled at our vehicle, appearing out of the night, but in no other way frightened or threatening. Startled the heck out of the two of us, though. I have never seen anything like it. This was also around 1.45 in the morning. Weather conditions were very clear, calm and cool. The night was very dark, with only starlight, and the headlights of our vehicle on high beam providing any light or illumination. I have no personal knowledge of other sightings of this nature in this particular area. This happened in Yellowstone Park, on the east entrance into the park, coming from Cody, Wyoming direction. At the base of the mountain, the road crews had huge gravel piles that they were using in building this new road. I was looking up the mountain to see if I could spot bighorn sheep as we had seen grizzly and many other of the Yellowstone animals while driving the loop of the park. I immediately noticed at one on the side of the mountain, nearest a top large triangular patch of snow, and walking in strides, a tall and eight to nine foot hairy, upright, bigfoot-like animal. It was so tall that you couldn't help but not see it. Then, it made three strides across this rocky terrain, and stopped just above a green grassy-like area next to the snow. My son saw the same sight as I, because he was excited, saying that it looked and walked like Chewbacca, the Star Wars character. Even though it was so high above us, you could make out what it was. I'm only sorry that we couldn't stop and pull off, but the traffic was fast, and nowhere to pull off because of road crews. As we're driving out of the park, there was a lot of road construction involving the park roads. 
the work crews were all along the area in which I saw it high up, on the side of the mountain. There was a snow. I would like to know if there have been sightings of this thing in the area before. The flag girl on the roadside was not aware of any sightings, but I'm interested to find this out. Since my husband was driving, he was unable to see it, but my younger son saw the same sight as myself.